I just wanted to, to try to do something that was different enough to be special. Because it is part of what we, I feel we lack in our lives in contemporary society. So it's not only the sound, it's not the range, but these existing pieces that I always was extremely careful with how to play them. Now they just play themselves. In St. Petersburg, Florida, some folks are always trying to find ways to beat the heat, while others are trying to make things hotter. Like the three ceramic artists, and the founders of St. Petersburg Clay Company, who between them have over 75 years of experience with throwing, firing, and turning up the heat. And I started working for a place called Minnesota Clay Company, and um, they were a major ceramic supplier in Minnesota. And I mixed clay with them for 10 years and uh, decided that I wanted to move to Florida. I did art fairs back in, in the early 70s in Minnesota. And I wanted to start back into pottery in Florida. So I met up with Russ, and he kind of gave me a little direction. And uh, since then, we started St. Petersburg Clay Company. I was uh, in my final quarter of school at Florida State University. And uh, I was headed towards law school. And uh, I took a pottery course as an elective, and uh, that was really a, a very defining moment in my life. I, I enjoyed the class very much, and uh, I really enjoyed working with clay. I, I was taking a printmaking course and a woodworking course at the same time, but the, uh, the clay, uh, the material itself, was very seductive for me. And, uh, I've been making pots ever since then. Wandered by the art uh, building at Mercer University where I was attending school late one evening, and I still remember the young man's name, Bob Allison, was in the art building all by himself in front of a large window throwing a pot. I was kind of like the person at the pet store. My nose was up against the window as I watched him throw. Um, this went on for a few minutes, and then he graciously opened the window and asked me if I'd like to come inside and, and throw a pot. Uh, and so I did, and I watched him throw another one, and then I tried, and he made it look so easy. Um, but I think uh, what really attracted me to it that evening uh, was just the material that I was dealing with. Uh, it was malleable, and I could make something. It wasn't as nice as what Bob was doing by any means, but it gave me some goals to shoot for, and I realized the potential with it. Russ and Charlie and I had been teaching at the Art Center in St. Petersburg for, oh, five years in some cases. Charlie was probably came on board a little later than that, but that's where we got to know each other. And we all had a number of students that were ready to kind of break out of the boundaries that the Art Center had imposed on them just through their limitations. And so what we've tried to do at St. Pete Clay is provide some additional opportunities for people that are interested in the ceramic arts. Hot Alley is the name that we came up with for our clay uh, studios, um, kind of as a cohesive um, element to draw together 20 diverse individuals that we have working over there and give them a title um, so that they can kind of collectively be known as this group. It has a little bit of history. Uh, we're fortunate next door to us to have Chuck Books and his Sigma Glass Studios. So in the grand scheme of things, one day we see the whole street being flame-oriented, so to speak, <laughs> uh, with kilns belching smoke and heat out of all the roofs. Uh, so we, we jokingly referred to the street as Hot Alley when we were busy working on the building in the beginning. And that's kind of where the name grew from. And I think we do it, A, for the challenge. and. Uh um, also, it's just a lot of fun. It's just enjoyable. You meet, you meet stimulating people. You meet creative people. Um, it, it's enjoyable. Uh, the, the work itself is, it's extremely hard work. It's not, not something that's, you know, easy to do.
It looks easy. It looks easy. We someone, can make it look easy. Yeah, we, someone that knows how to do it, it looks, uh, it looks very easy, but uh, it, it's not. But um, it's, a, it's extremely hard work. Uh, the first thing I do when I make pots is I wedge the clay. And wedging the clay is a process that makes the clay homogenous in its mixture. It tends to work out any uh, foreign particulates that could be in the clay. Um, the thing that it does for me, though, and the main reason I wedge the clay is because the material tells me a lot about itself, how wet it is, how dry it is. It gives me information as to what I can do with it. Uh, after the clay's wedged, I throw it down on the wheel head, which is where the term throwing comes from, and I center it, which is pushing the clay into the very center of the wheel head, so it's spinning truly. I then sink my thumbs into the clay, add a little bit of water to lubricate the clay, and then after I sink my thumbs into the clay, I stick my fingers in the clay, and then I open the clay. I pull the clay back to me. And this allows me to place my left hand on the inside of the clay and my right hand on the outside of the clay. Kind of grab the clay at the bottom and then proceed to pull the clay upwards. And this is forming the, the walls of the pot. After I have a cylinder, which I most of the time I start with a cylinder form, I apply some shape to it. I use um, simple tools, ribs, uh, wooden knives, uh, primarily my hands though, and I either push the pot out from the inside to give it a full form or I push from the outside on the pot to narrow it or constrict it. Some of the decorative techniques that I use are slips and I comb through the slip or I will what I call drawing on the pot and I tend to erase and add information as I go. Uh, I use roller stamps, which are textured clay rollers that uh, I impress into the clay and then I expand the form or I rib some of that off, either making the information very prominent or uh, pushing it more to the background. Glazes are probably the thing that attracts most people's eyes to pots. Um, some are shiny, some are dull, some are vivid colors, some are just very natural, homely colors. Um, people have been making glazes um, uh, for as long as people have been making pots, and we're always trying. It's kind of modern alchemy. But technically speaking, a glaze is a combination of certain materials, and uh, these materials can be categorized as uh, stabilizers, uh, fluxes, and glass formers. Um, stabilizers are um, materials that tend to kind of form the, the, the meat and bones of the glaze. Uh, fluxes are the material that causes the various materials in the glaze to actually melt. And the glass formers, which really there's only one, and that would be silica, is what causes the, uh, the glassy sheen that you see on, on gloss glazes. And by adjusting those percentages of these different materials, you can get, you know, amazing differences in, in the appearance of the glaze. And then when you add that to the many different ways you can fire a glaze, um, you know, it's compounded even again. Well, the Minnesota pop, uh, we can call it whatever we want, but it's a uh, trapping air 
with the pot inverted and popping it, and it takes and pulls the glaze into the pot, glazes the inside as well as the outside all in one motion. And uh, to do that successfully, it's, um, it's kind of a, it's hard to explain, it's hard to do. I tell all my students to practice in their bathtubs um, with a, a clear glass so they can see the action. At St. Pete Clay, we have a combination of old and new. We use electric kilns uh, for a lot of the bisque work and some of our glaze work, but primarily most of the finished ware comes out of our uh, gas kiln at this point, especially tableware and things like that. And the one thing that we can do with the gas kiln that we can't do with the electric kilns is create a reduction atmosphere inside the kiln. Um, the reduction atmosphere is what draws the oxides out of the pot. Is basically we're pumping in more fuel than the kiln can burn so it's starving for air and it's trying to combust this excess fuel that's in the kiln and in doing so it draws oxides and things out of the clay body and out of the glaze so that you have a co an interaction between the clay and the glaze that you don't get at any other temperature or in any other atmosphere um, so we use the gas kiln for a lot of our tableware and a lot of our functional wear and things like that we have the raku firing process which came to us from um, the Japanese, and of course we've Americanized it quite a bit. Uh, we don't follow the traditional steps that they used to. But basically you use a smaller kiln because you fire a lot of these pieces individually or one or two at a time um, to get the surfaces that you want. So it goes in a small kiln. You heat the small kiln up to approximately 1,750 degrees, 1,800 degrees. It's a very visual process. You're staring into the kiln most of the time that you're firing, watching what physical uh, attributes are happening to the, to the glaze surface as, as you take it through the temperature range. Um, so it's a very visual experience and you do a lot of it but just by watching the pot as you fire it. And then once the glaze is melted, we actually open the kiln, reach in with some tongs um, while the temp kiln is at temperature. So you're dealing with a piece of ceramic material that's 17 or 1800 degrees, we take it out of the kiln and at that point it goes through or into the next process which is called the post-firing reduction. And basically what we're trying to do is put, again, put more combustible material in there than can burn, starves for oxygen, starts to have some effect on the clay body. I think the most predominant things that you notice with Raku um, will, would be the crackle on the clear glaze or the glass glazes that you use. Because you cool the pot so rapidly, the glaze shrinks at a very rapid rate and actually cracks and crazes. And then in the post-firing reduction, you're using combustible material and you have a lot of carbon. And the carbon tends to settle in these cracks and on the exposed clay surfaces. So any exposed clay surfaces or the crackle pattern that you develop on the piece is highlighted with black lines. And then the piece is allowed to cool in the container and then you take it out and you clean it and then it's ready to be displayed. So we realized that as pots were being produced, we uh, needed a place to put them. So we created, uh, I really wouldn't call this a gallery, I would call it maybe a showroom. And uh, it's just display space for all of the work that's being created here. Um, we really didn't want to get into the gallery business because it's, uh, that's a hard job in itself. There's a lot of uh, uh, follow-up work. There's a lot of time spent running a gallery and uh, we, we really wanted to make pots and kind of watch other people make pots. We didn't want to get into the, the hardcore gallery scene. It's something I don't think that you ever master and I think it's probably if you look at um, clay work in a historical perspective of why People have always done it, all cultures have done it, and they still continue to do it. So it's like, well, if there was a, a good substitute for it, or uh, uh, you know, a better way to do it, or a way to make more money doing it, or 
You know, you would think after you know, thousands of years somebody would have figured that out. But the, the desire and the demand for, and I guess the, the internal urge to, to make pots, to get your hands in clay and make something, it's, it's almost a primal thing, it seems to me. It's, it's displayed by um, all cultures all over the world and it always has been and I somehow suspect it always will be. I just wanted to, to try to do something that was different enough to be special. Because it is part of what we, I feel we lack in our lives in contemporary society. So it's not only the sound, it's not the range, but these existing pieces that I always was extremely careful with how to play them. Now they just play themselves. Dover, Florida, a suburb of Tampa, is the home base of puppet builder and actress, dancer, Holly Rubin. But she finds her home changing from day to day as she tours with the Bits and Pieces Puppet Theater across the United States and around the world. Life on the road, what a lot of fun it is. I never get tired of it. It's probably because I feel like I'm a sightseer, I'm a tourist through life. Wherever we go, you see something new. As artistic director and performer with the Giant Puppet Company, Holly's work has enlivened children everywhere for the past 21 years. My first recollection of being a performer is probably my first thoughts of being alive. But I really do remember when my parents' friends would come over and I would dance for them. And I would not just dance in, in the living room, I would dance up the stairway and down the stairway and have costume pieces. And I would do one side of Swan Lake and then I would want to do the other side of the album. So of course my parents gave me dancing lessons at three years old. And I danced through my whole life. I was in the Fort Lauderdale Civic Ballet and I loved to dance. But I always knew dancing wasn't the only thing for me because almost everyone I danced for said, why do you make faces when you dance? A dancer dances with their whole body and, and look what you're doing. You're telling the whole story with your face. So I knew that th eventually I would work with theater. Now in Fort Lauderdale where I grew up, there was a wonderful arts community on Las Olas Boulevard and there were wonderful sculpture classes and painting classes. So as I was even in first or second grade, I took art classes and I got a chance to work with clay and with paints and find out about drawing and, and it was a wonderful thing and it was something I always enjoyed doing. So I could do the dance and I could do the theater, but along the way I, my hobby was painting and drawing and, and doing all that hands-on sort of thing. It was great to get paint all over you, that was always a thrill to me. Well, the puppets have to be creative. That's the first part that's my job. 
if it's an animal character, I'll find out what that animal really looks like. And I use that as a point of departure. And I do depart from it. Uh, and then if I look for pictures out of children's books or pictures out of, out of books that might have a facial characteristic I like, a certain smile, a certain eyebrow, a certain ear, perhaps I'm making an animal puppet and I find a human picture that has the right expression, I just put that right in there. And so I make a collage of all these different little pictures that have something about them that will inspire me to create the character. And then I take out my clay. And I have years of, I have pounds and pounds of clay. But I have to make an armature. And I use styrofoam and I stick it on pieces of metal to get a general shape because a lion face is long and thin or a human face will be round. So you've got to stick all of that together. And you know, sometimes you get inspired because the styrofoam comes out a certain way and it makes the head tilt a certain way or head that way. And then you learn something else about the character. Then you pile that clay on there and you really work until your hands are burning up and they actually help to make the clay. It's modeling clay and it models the clay. And as you're doing it, the character changes and shifts. And then you have to keep turning it because you want all your facial characteristics to go back because the kids don't just see the puppets from the front, they see it in the back. So you have to keep turning it and spinning it and finding how to bring that character to life no matter which direction. And in puppetry, it's wonderful because you want this side to be maybe a little happier and this side to be a little crueler so that when the character moves, it has a little different personality, whichever way it goes. The whole thing is covered with this material. Nowadays, there's many different materials you can use, but the, the name when I started was Celastic, so I still call all the materials Celastic. When it's finally dry, you cut it and you take it off of this mold, and it's a positive mold, and that's very exciting because when you pop it off, you, you, the character's alive. It just comes right off at you, and you still have the clay, too, which is kind of neat to see what's left, and you reassemble the two pieces of the, of the head. And that's when the work on putting in the moving parts begins, the cross beams, the part that's gonna make the puppet stand up on its backpack. And once we get that situated, then usually that's when we start putting on that plastic wood. We call it plastic wood soup. It's plastic wood, acetone, and baby powder. And it's a special formula. And you mix it all up and you put it all over the head. And when it dries, you begin sanding it. And the sanding surface, if, if you want, if you have a person, you want that nice, smooth, fleshy quality. If it's an animal, it doesn't matter so much. Sometimes you add fabric. By the time you get it sanded, you're ready to start to paint. And that is the part that I really enjoy because that goes back to your theater training and putting on makeup and doing clown makeup and all. Because I paint with my hands. I do everything with my hands. So I, I'll stick a little bit of paint on and then I'll start to blend it, just like a, a uh, makeup artist would do a face. And sometimes you'll blend it and make it look smooth. Sometimes you'll decide you're gonna go in little dots everywhere and make it look all, all pointillism and that sort of thing. It just all depends on what your mood is. And then that's when you give it its color. Then it's fun to wig, put fabric on. And before you know it, you have a character that has as much life as the person who created it. Mm. That's what you think. Listen to this. Ballad of Jose Gaspar as our first giant show. So that's when we started to work with talented set designers to create a whole picture because no longer did we have a little square with a puppet box. We now had to fill the whole proscenium with our show. And that started the beginning of our giant productions and the success of our company. When we could come to a theater, we could fill their stage, no matter what size, with this big spectacle, this big musical. And that kind of set what we did in children's theater in the, with the Giants. We've been doing this for years and years. So many places we've been for 10 and 12 
years they, because we have 12 giant shows so a theater can keep bringing us back with a different show each year so we've actually had audiences that have come to us at three and four years old and they came with their parents to the Saturday show and they sat there even before they were in school and then when they were in school they came to see the shows and they become more and more sophisticated audience so at first they just clap along to the music and before you know it they respond where they can clap to the verse that's just right to clap to and then they stop because they want to hear the words that are coming so you're actually seeing exactly what the big facilities want which is your you're growing a cultured audience a sophisticated audience and you're taking them and you're taking them along the way with things that they want to know and things that they want to do. As a performer, all of that just floods right back to you. There'll be a day when you'll get up and you'll say, today I'm just going to do my job. I'm a professional. I can be a good dancer. I can do everything I need to do. And I'm not going to give any more than that. And then the first giggle happens. And the first clap happens. And the first kind of vibe you get from the audience. And before you know it, you've thrown that aside. And you've just totally pouring your heart out. And you're dancing and you're singing. and. Uh, and it has nothing to do with being a job at all. It's just sharing ideas. And I love doing that. That's, that's, that's my favorite thing, to be able to get out there and share. Our work is very much, um, it's puppetry, it's dance, it's theater. We work with wonderful choreographer. We, it, it's theater. And it also has an element of mind, because the puppet only tells a story if you move it so that it projects an idea. So for every word and for every part of the story, you have a movement. And so as a, as a actress dancer, that's very fulfilling because you're expressing your ideas not just with your mouth and not just with your eyes, but with your whole body. And, and so, and as you do, the kids, they respond with their whole body. You know, they are so excited. And after the show, you meet them and they're, they're shaking. They're so excited to get a chance to meet these characters. And you get that. And to the little ones, you're real. You're really an ant. And so as we tour through the years, uh, uh, our tours get more and more complicated. We have more and more people with us all the time. Now I bring my whole family. We have a four, Jerry and I have a four-year-old. We take our family. We take a, a big tech crew. But really, it always comes back down to the one-to-one, -one, the audience and the performer back and forth, and that communication. And that's what theater is all about. We've done Asia because in Asia, there's a great respect for the puppet. Even the giant puppet is part of some religious service, um, uh, religious ceremonies and parades. So the idea of the giant character coming to life is, is something that's very exciting. Plus, in Asia, there was a great interest in learning English. And here's this company that's doing big Broadway, where we do the American Broadway-style musical, and we, we repeat the songs and we sing and the children can sing along. So that's very educational for children from other countries. But we have not done Europe. Well, this year, the state is actually helping us tour to Europe. So in the next year to come, we'll be performing in, in England. We'll be performing in Germany. We'll be performing in the Netherlands. And we may even be teaching in India. That's in the works. But so it, the, the tour extends and it grows. And you know, whenever, as the tour grows, and sometimes you're in small facilities, most of the time you're in big facilities, because that's what the giants are designed for. Um, as, as this tour grows, we learn something. We are not only educating our public, we're getting an education. We're getting to see puppets from around the world. We're getting to find out about other cultures. We're getting to see what the different way of thinking around the world is and try to find that place where it all meets and where real communication happens because, like the caveman, all we're trying to do is communicate and share positive ideas. A typical day might be uh, uh, getting up at 5.30 or 6 o'clock to do a load-in by 6.30. Most tech crews don't want to do it earlier than that. If, if it's going to be earlier than that, they want to do it the night before. So we get up early, the alarm clock goes up, and then you start drinking that coffee because you need to be totally awake to find the place and get the vehicle all backed up while the crew that you've never met before is watching you back up. And then finally you open the doors, and that's always exciting too because when a tech crew sees our little trailer pulling in at 16 feet long, they think, ah, ha, ha, it's a little kid show. And then when it opens and it's put together like some kind of a tight puzzle in there, they all go, oh, it's a kid show. And we start unloading and then setting up those stands and also directing the crew because they want to help, but they need to know what to help with. So you're directing them and trying to get your work done, getting the puppets up, getting the scenery flying, getting the sound just right 
teaching the people who are on deck that are going to move your scenery during the show what to do and to give them the confidence to believe that they can do it. Showing the fly person where you want things, what's the trim, how far in, how far out. The fly person is the one who brings the scenery in. Uh, getting that mirror ball just right so it makes the stars happen, which is magic. You know, it, and getting all of your effects equipment. And then nowadays you have to program in the cues because we have a world of computers. So you have to program the cues in so that when the tech person, when our technician tells them this cue or that cue, it all happens just right. I pull back a few minutes before the show, much earlier than the rest of the crew because I have to put my makeup on. So I have to go upstairs and, and do that and get put on the face and the costume. And while you're doing that, you're just hoping that everything else is being laid out the way it, it needs to be. And then I come downstairs and, and we're ready to do the show. The show happens, it happens smoothly, it happens wonderfully, you're feeling good. And then you go out and you hug the kids afterwards and you hug them. That's part of my job, I hug kids and what a great job that is. Meet the kids, hug them, make them believe. But then I tell the kids, now I have my other job to do. I'm going to go back, I'm going to put my blue jeans on and pack up the puppets and take them back. Well, I'm not doing this by myself, of course, but to the kids, oh, they're amazed that, you know, the fairy princess is going to go put on blue jeans and tear down the show. So I go back and by then the scenery is being dropped. The lighting is being brought down. And we bag all the puppets and then there's the carry out. And you carry out all that stuff. The crew is working hard. I'm carrying the little things, but they're carrying those big puppets those and the big set pieces. And then goodbye to the crew, but it's not over. We get in the van and pull out the map, see where the next town is that we're going to go to, and off we go to the, next, to the next venue, to the next facility. And many times we'll drive seven, eight, nine hours to get to the next place, get in in the middle of the night, set that alarm clock, and ding-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, it's time for another day in Puppet World. <laughs> I just wanted to, to try to do something that was different enough to be special. Because it is part of what we, I feel we lack in our lives in contemporary society. So it's not only the sound, it's not the range, but these existing pieces that I always was extremely careful with how to play them. Now they just play themselves. Tampa, Florida is home to woodcarver extraordinaire, Frazier Smith. Along with a few hundred other professional artists, Frazier exhibits his work at Tampa's renowned Gasparilla Festival of the Arts. I, I think I became an artist because I really wanted to do something that was special. His unique creations of pigmented wood that look surprisingly like cloth have been recognized for excellence with local, state, and national honors. A word that is often used to describe Frazier's artwork is amazing. Nestled in the urban setting of South Tampa, Frazier's intimate studio is where he spends the better part of his week, at times working upwards of 70 hours in anticipation of his next show. Probably my first experience with art 
was uh, in the third grade, there was a contest to do a, a political themed painting or sculpture or something. So I, was, I guess I was eight years old and, and I did uh, a sculpture of an elephant and of a donkey out of uh, clay. Uh, and um, and it turned out it it won you know the first prize for the for the this this little contest it was in Natchez Mississippi you know little elementary school there and then my father uh, drilled them out and mounted them on this block of wood and I still have the piece well I chose wood uh, as as a medium because uh, it's something that I've been in uh, in contact with throughout my life. My my father ran a sawmill when I was a kid, and he used to to get wood and uh, bring it home. And uh, he was a whittler. He had we had some carving tools and things, and so I I worked in that medium uh, as a kid. But then in college, the major sort of sculpture professor at school also worked in wood and uh, they had a very good woodworking facility so uh, for me it was just natural to go ahead and develop uh, my work in that medium so uh, essentially that's how I ended up getting sort of a collection of the right tools together to work in wood Essentially, I started out with clothing because I'd, I'd carved a rose um, out of the, some pieces of rosewood and, and then fashioned it together. And uh, I sort of had this rosebud thing that I, I wanted to uh, display in some way. And, and so I thought, well, you know, I could put it in the lapel of a coat. And uh, I said, well, you know, do I want to carve the whole coat? I don't know. So I just carved the lapel of a tuxedo and had it where it was hooked into the lapel, and I kind of liked the piece. So I said, well, why not just do a whole coat and, and then do a rose <laughs> for it? So uh, I, I found that I had this really neat, uh, it was uh, a double-breasted sort of sports coat, white, very classy looking, but, but real old and sort of stained and messed up uh, coat that uh, I had gotten at the Salvation Army or something. and, and uh, I used it as a model, and that piece took uh, two years to do. There's a special bond that we have personally with these things. They, they might have been uh, worn a lot or worn for a special occasion, or the types of things that we would wear when we had some sort of uh, good or profound memory of, uh, of a particular time in the past. That's why I did the caps. Uh, I started off doing caps three or four years after I did the coat, I, I did my first cap. And these caps are the types of things that people just hang on to them when they're worn out. There's always a little bit of information on the front and you can play around with uh, expressions and popular culture and things like that through, through the labels on the caps. I'd been carving maybe six years when I did my first quilt and it has that same kind of feeling as the, as the clothing. The quilts, even when they wear out, you're not gonna throw it away. Generally, it's something that people will keep, fold it up, or you know, try to put it on the bed or something. I tend to do more of, of what I consider sort of the North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, that uh, sort of the Appalachian type uh, patterns, but, but I'll take that pattern and what I try to do is modify it in some way that, that sort of modernizes it, uh, perhaps. Uh, but if you, if you look at the, the pattern that I've come out with, you can uh, still see what it was derived from. On my third piece, I started using the computer to design the work, and, and actually I named it after the file. It was a bitmap file, and .bmp would be the extension, the file extension for a bitmap file. Obviously, things have gotten a lot more sophisticated since then. This was like 1991 or 92, uh, as far as the computers, the, the power of the computer that I can use and stuff. This is what I 
uh, designed for the sort of general layout. Of course, nothing's filled in yet. This essentially uh, gave me sort of the general idea of the width and the height, the way the quilt was going to be folded, uh, the size of, of each square. The sampler is a traditional type quilt where it, it would allow you to, to use the work of, of uh, several different people as far as each pattern goes, and each one would go in, in a little block. This way I can, I can take certain squares of it that I like and, and remove them and move them around and take them and rearrange them and recolor them, do all sorts of things I want to with these, uh, and hopefully come out with a piece that, that I'm satisfied with. You just kind of play around a little bit, and uh, then you save it and you move on. And then I would print this out and uh, it'll give us uh, generally an idea of, uh, of what I wanted to have for uh, this particular design. This gives me an idea of really where I want to go and I can take that. It's all set, laid out on the, on the page at one eighth of an inch equals one inch. So it's, uh, I can take that out to the studio, that, that uh, printout to the studio, and um, use it to, to lay out my design for uh, any given piece. And so that's the way I uh, design my work. When I start essentially on a piece, it's uh, four inches thick uh, by whatever dimensions, maybe five feet wide by three and a half feet high, say. Uh, I'll take that and um, generally sketch out sort of the outline of the piece and try to determine where I want the folds, that, uh, the undulations, so to speak, on the surface so that you get the general shape of a hanging quilt. From there, um, I essentially just draw it out in uh, pencil, and, and then I go around and uh, using a utility knife, I cut in, I literally chip carve the design of the, the piece into the uh, surface of the quilt that's been shaped out. Then I start uh, carving the stitches and the uh, sort of puckers and, and lumps and bumps that you'll see on the finished surface. So at that point, I, I grind a ruby stone that grinds the surface down a, a bit smoother and really prepares it for sanding. Uh, I'll grind it once, and then I'll spray it with alcohol. The alcohol lifts the drain. Uh, is, if you're sanding or grinding on, on this wood, it, essentially the, the grain is, is not sanded smooth, but it's torn or, or pressed down. Uh, more than cut off. So essentially you, you have to raise that grain back up so you can do the process all over again, but of course it's smoother then. After you're staining it, you don't want to have to go back and do any sanding again. So uh, you have to make sure it's ready for that. So the stain goes down in and you, you stain uh, you know, one little patch at a time. Uh, this patch, then move on to the next, move on to the next, changing the colors constantly to uh, so you can progress along the piece without sticking your hand or something else into the piece that you just finished that's still wet. When you start on a patch, you do the whole patch before you stop. For instance, on a lot of these things, they've got a border that runs around that's all one same color, and it's all essentially giving the illusion that it's out of one piece of cloth, but it, it might cover, God, uh, a square yard of the surface of the piece. Uh, so Essentially, you start on one side and you keep progressing because what happens with watercolor is when it dries, it leaves a line. If you try to go back and start from that point, you, you can't do that. Uh, you have to take the, the wet and, and continue and have it drying as you move along because if you let it dry, you'll end up with this sort of uh, stain line that appears in the piece, which you don't want because then you're losing the illusion of a single piece of fabric. Then the last thing I do is I add the rope. Uh, the rope is just an illusion. It's important that you hang the rope in such a way that, that it, it retains this illusion that the piece is, is not uh, 
floating in the air, but is, is actually hanging from the rope, even though it's not. There's no way the rope could actually support the weight. I just wanted to try to do something that was different enough uh, to be special, but uh, also something that it's, it's not different just to be different. It's different in a way that people can really appreciate and, and enjoy that uh, thing. But in a way, it's almost like being a magician, too, with the type of work I do. When you see it, on the one hand, uh, y you make a, uh, a judgment about it, and then when you, when you realize what it's made of, you have to, have to switch everything around in your head immediately. It's, it's like saying, where did that uh, dove or rabbit come from? I mean, uh, it, you have to change your whole perception there, and that's, that's really what I'm, I'm trying to do, is, is have people feel that sort of amazement at uh, something that's, that's been made. I just wanted to, to try to do something that was different enough to be special. Because it is part of what we, I feel we lack in our lives in contemporary society. So it's not only the sound, it's not the range, but these existing pieces that I always was extremely careful with how to play them, now they just play themselves. St. Petersburg, Florida, known for its beautiful beaches, white sands, and balmy nights, is the artistic haven of visual artist and printmaker Margaret Stewart. I work very intuitively, so I simply follow the lead of the material. While Margaret's vibrant oil prints are seductive, it's their moray quality that holds the viewer's attention. Well, my first recollections of art making. Let's see. I lived in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, about uh, mm, when I was about 10. Uh, my father was in Africa for the year, and um, he used to send postcards of monkeys and jungle scenes. And that was sort of the only connection I had to him. My mother bought me some uh, oil paints and canvases, and I just painted those postcards. Um, I also uh, learned portraiture from a pastel artist. My mother used to take me uh, for a walk. It was a long walk, and uh, sometimes in the snow <laughs> to see this portrait artist. And uh, he taught me a very precise technique of uh, doing portraits in pastel. I did those till I was about uh, 16 or 17. People would ask me to do their picture for them, and, and I did. So, yeah, I, I learned technique fairly young on my own. I made art ever since I can remember. And the progression of my work uh, basically depended on what took my interest at the moment. I learned along the way that I'm not very good at doing anything twice. And I find it ironic that um, all the media I choose are media that are designed for repetition. Filmmaking has numerous frames. Photography can be reproduced. Printmaking is also a reproducible medium. I one day sandwiched two slides together, and that set up three years' worth of just sandwiching slides together, sandwiching slides together, 
which is a way of layering images and creating a world, uh, a photographic world that doesn't read as photographic. You sort of reach dead ends in media, and it, then it's time to move on. But what it gave me, working in film and working in layers like that, is being able to visualize layers and how things come through other images. So when I started on the, uh, with the press, printmaking, it was a fairly natural transition. In fact, people look at my work sometimes uh, who have seen my previous work and know right away it's me. So I think there's a certain part of the person that carries through the imagery, no matter what media you choose. We all want to move, we all want to change, we don't want to be regarded as static. And, and that's what life is, it's movement and change. So I guess it just has to look uh, new to you, not to anyone else. Looking at a piece of paper is not a lot different than looking at a blank canvas. Uh, printmaking is commonly regarded as something you set up beforehand and then put the paper down on and transfer it. I don't really like to think of the printmaking process that way. I start out with sometimes an idea or a notion more than an idea, a full-blown idea, and sometimes no idea at all. But what I do start out with is a collection of things that have inspired me um, as I walk around and uh, as I have sort of over the years enhanced my vision for uh, details and texture and pattern. So uh, as a thumbnail sketch to, let's say, setting up a print, I would uh, collect some materials of, uh, with various textures. Um, something maybe in a magazine or a photograph that I took will inspire me enough to cut out a stencil. I'll set, lay out different colors of ink, um, and I'll just ink away, uh, laying stuff on top of other things um, in a kind of a mobile choreograph way without, uh, without really regard, some sense of internal sense of composition, but without a real regard for what the final product will be. And maybe by the, I'll play around with those for a while, print them. I'll utilize what's called an after image, where I'll peel up pieces that I've printed, and it will leave uh, another impression. Or I might turn that piece over and uh, use it on a, a completely different color base. I work strongly with contrast, because I believe that life is contrast, and to, uh, to indicate uh, life and to indicate energy, you have to work with contrast. So if you look closely at my prints, you'll see uh, strong, maybe black and white, not usually, but complementary colors. So it's an instinct for working that way uh, in a more complex, uh, patterned way. It's difficult to describe. So I'm always internally, when I'm thinking while I'm working, I'm working on this will look good against that color, and this will look good against that color, and how do I play this off against that part of the image? Um, and sometimes they do read in a very complex fashion, but with the final result comes out as a, uh, I call it sort of a moiré effect, where your mind can move from one image to another and find things in the foreground, find things in the background, sometimes mix foreground and background, and that's what gives the print a vibration, a life. And that's the kind of thing we want, we wish to happen in artwork, is to have the piece be a moving image on the wall. And that metaphor, of course, comes from being a filmmaker. Once you're a filmmaker, you, a still image is just never satisfactory, <laughs> is it? <laughs> I find a lot of artists worry about how they're going to sell their work, and I, I'm more concerned with creating quality work, and I, my feeling is that if the work is good, eventually it's going, it'll happen. So it's more important to work on developing your skill and your, the quality of your work. So uh, I don't worry about it too much. I think uh, it seems that in this culture the arts aren't as regarded as widely as, and as well as we might like it, uh, but there's a sort of a give and take, and the more work you put into it, the more, the more benefit you gain. And uh, 
the downside is that as an artist, you also end up being uh, kind of an administrator and a manager of your own work. You have to take slides of your work. You have to take good slides of your work. You have to get the slides reproduced. You have to be able to write fairly well to uh, write statements about your work. Um, you almost have to, in a way, become your own critic. You have to write uh, grants to get money to get some notice. There's a whole sort of system of getting of setting up. I even get fed up with that sometime, and I just I get tired of being at the sort of mercy of curators and people who want to put me in this or that show. I've curated a few shows myself. I think artists need to artists know the heartbeat best of what's happening in an art community. They need to get together and arrange themes for shows and shows and find places to show, and. Um, and not be so much at the mercy of people who are sort of at a different, uh, who are just showing art, that we need to show our own art. We're a large, in large part who is educating people about art. And the outdoor shows, for all their downside, has that aspect. You are there with your work. You are out there bearing your soul, and people will come up and talk to you about your art. And eventually, down the line, you've developed clientele from them and connections. And in a, when art is put in a context that's not so pristine and uh, distant as a museum, people are more receptive towards it. And they, they actually, over the years, you do end up educating people about it. I tend to regard, now looking at my work, I see a lot of archaeology in it. And I studied geology, and I studied uh, fossils and remnants, and I studied the earth, and I think the time that I spent doing that comes is now coming out, the understanding of that is coming out as an art as opposed to science. Um, even the fact that I uh, collect materials just for their essence, the rocks or the uh, uh, different patterns and textures, essentially they're all sort of organic in nature. and. They stay with, I'm not much of a, I don't consider myself a collector of stuff. I try to get rid of as, as much stuff as possible. But there's a certain time period where it's, it flow, things flow in and out of my life, and I keep them around until there's something that needs to be accomplished with that thing um, to bring it out, or it echoes some uh, deeper source in myself and uh, comes out in the art. So in that sense, uh, I am an archaeologist, just not in uh, the scientific way of knowing about things, but in the artistic way. It's really necessary to teach periodically, but it's not necessary to teach for a living. There's a certain amount of energy output that you, you really can't afford when you're putting it into your art making. Um, and you'll hear teachers, art teachers talk, as it's a common complaint. Um, but on the other hand, you can't really move on. I found you can't move on yourself until you've shared some of what you know. So the more you pass on, really, the more essentially frees you up to move on. And in that same spirit, it's not necessary to keep secrets about what you do. It's more important to share what you do. No one's really going to do what you do. No one, no two brains are alike. No two hearts are the same. So everything that you teach them, students, it's really quite wonderful to see where they go with it. And uh, oftentimes, I'm the one who ends up learning more than my students do. They think that they've learned a lot, and I've certainly shared a lot with them. But when I come out of a uh, teaching session. That's why I like to teach intensive workshops very sporadically and periodically whenever I feel like it. I find that it, it helps both the students and myself. I was involved in a series of car accidents. I had lost a lot of uh, control of my right hand. Not control, but it just hurt all the time to do anything. And uh, as it goes with that, using your right hand, which is that's the hand that I make art with, um, everything I did hurt. Everything I, I couldn't crank it larger up. I couldn't run my press. So I spent a lot of time trying to heal myself directly, doing yoga and doing uh, beefing up my nutrition and vitamins and all this, going to a lot of doctors. 
chiropractors and acupuncturists trying to heal myself. I thought that's where my work needed to be at that time. Otherwise, how in the world was I going to ma make art again? But at a certain point in the progression of healing, I just basically got fed up and I decided that I needed to work anyway, even if it hurt. I started to pick up the pieces, literally the pieces that I had collected and putting, put them together. It seemed easier at the time than printing them or coming up with ideas. The ideas weren't really right there. And I started working in, I wouldn't call it sculpture, but it's called sculpture. I call them more constructions, kind of a, a reconstruction and a and repatterning. In fact, some of the pieces from that time have actually, I've used dress patterns in different ways and with different materials. Uh, kind of mixed media uh, wall pieces and uh, uh, just stuff that's sort of coming off the wall and stuff that is uh, utilizing objects in a different way. And what happened what, from all that uh, body of work is that without realizing it, with using my hands in a very physical way and using power tools was actually what ended up healing my arm to a large extent. And it happened rather unconsciously. It had to do with bringing uh, new ideas into physical three-dimensional form, which for me was a very, very powerful concept at the time. It's three-dimensional was not in my art vocabulary. And uh, now I'm at a point where I don't know whether I'll continue with that or go back or whatever. It's just sort of kind of a lull right now. But it's a time also to seek new inspiration and new stimuli and uh, new experiences. And I know that the next body of work may look different. It may evolve, clearly evolve from the last body of work. But it will be something new to me. Big burning question of being an artist through an artist's lifetime is what is it to be an artist? It's something people will define you as an artist if you do this, that, and the other. Many times I don't feel like an artist because I don't really draw anymore. Although I know how to draw and I used to draw. And the whole process of growth as an artist or as a person is answering that question. And every day you answer that question differently.